Hi. Today we're going to talk about chapter four, <clears throat> diversity among small group members. Uh, you're probably familiar with the concept of diversity, but it doesn't hurt to define it uh, from a small group perspective. Diversity is the joining of individuals who differ in cultural, demographic, and cognitive backgrounds. <clears throat> this is a definition by Harris and Sherblom, um, 2005, Newlip, 2006. Um, the, the key here is to remember culture, demographic, and cognitive backgrounds. So we're not going to um, stop too long on every aspect of it, just to go over culture and um, demographic a little bit, cognitive backgrounds um, very briefly, um, these three aspects of diversity. Um, but there are, you know, as, as you're familiar with it, uh, diversity usually refers to a person's gender, age, um, background, ethnicity, race, belief system, um, their religion, their, you know, lack of religion, learning styles, um, ability, health, and, and it turns out that all these different dimensions of an individual can be combined into bigger groups, cultural, demographic, cognitive. <clears throat> so uh, the focus would be on, on the things that people can process and use in small group work. Groups that include diverse members are richer and there is a tendency in academia and in workplaces to, to as assign um, higher value to diversity rather than to uh, a, a lack of such. Uh, groups that include members that are all similar in their cultural, demographic, and cognitive abilities, their backgrounds, those groups we called um, homogeneous, and the opposite is heterogeneous. heterogeneous. Uh, I may be pronouncing it wrong because I am a diverse member <laughs> of this group. My background um, is such that English is my third language and uh, I will take this opportunity to offer you an example <clears throat> of cultural diversity, linguistic cultural di diversity and, and don't forget class, right? Class is also a part of your um, culture, your background, so that also defines where are you born? Are you born rich? Are you born poor? So, as we said, diversity offers a lot of value, but why? Why is that so? Um, I, I will just offer you an example uh, from <clears throat> literature. Today, uh, as we're struggling to find solutions to COVID-19, conveniently enough, an Armenian entrepreneur, biotech um, incubator leader, has uh, come up with a process, uh, a project to create such a vaccine to uh, fight the global pandemic and he um, was interviewed by a fortune magazine where he said that his background as an immigrant has made him who he is now and has made his mind more flexible than it would otherwise be so i offered you uh, three paragraphs uh, of excerpts from an interview with Nubar Afeyan. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I think he collaborates with MIT. The vaccine is being created with MIT, but his company is called Moderna. And the nice thing about this example is that it's not just to read, but also to listen. There is a podcast that you can listen to. So this will give a nice break to your eyes if you turn on the podcast and listen to it with your eyes closed, maybe lying down, resting, that way you will absorb just the information without being distracted by the visuals. So this kind of, you know, brings us to the learning styles, which we will get to in a moment. But let's just go um, step by step. Are there any negative sides? To diversity in groups? Unfortunately, yes. And one example to show that the set of negative outcomes is not empty is that some people who consider themselves parts of minority groups may suspect that they are outnumbered by others. So if, if you're a minority group member, if you belong to a smaller um, 
you know, pocket of population by cultural, demographic, or learning style aspects. Um, you may find that the lack of similarity, the lack of continuity, um, creates a lack of communication between you and others. If you feel that your minority group is not represented as fully as you would like to, even if it is, that kind of hinders communication between the minority group and the others. There's always talk about differences. So difference can be a good thing, but it can also be a hindrance to communication because you can say, you just don't get it. You don't understand. You don't share my experience. You don't know what it means to be a woman, for example. So let's just uh, split it up into cultural and other forms of diversity. Cultural diversity is the total sum of beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, perceptions, customs, practices, languages, and other artifacts of social life that are learned, shared, and passed on by a group of people. So that is the definition of culture, um, and therefore cultural diversity would be um, diversity in those things, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, customs, practices, everything that is the superstructure, everything that you're not born into but acquired, shared and passed on by others. The author of this uh, definition is Hirokawa, uh, along with colleagues, uh, Hirokawa et al., as we say. Randy Hirokawa is one of um, the most well-known communication scholars from Hawaii. Um, he made this, he and his colleagues made this definition, wrote this definition in 2003. And another name who is cited here um, fully, Edward Hall, um, he defines culture, a cultural anthropologist, Edward Hall, um, defines culture um, is something that influences all aspects of communication. Actually, uh, cultural anthropologists are saying that culture is everywhere, not just in communication. But as we're talking about infrastructure, that is things that are acquired, built on um, through learning, through education, through sharing trans transference, rather than built into our existence, like things um, that come with territory. I was born in Armenia. I was born... Uh, let's say middle class, uh, or some, I was born working class, um, I'm born with blue eyes, you know, those things you cannot change very much, but culture can be changed, culture can be acquired. Um, so most members of culture are unaware that there are four dimensions of any culture. Power distance, uncertainty avoidance, individualism versus collectivism, and time orientation. So let's talk very briefly about these. Power distance is the inequality between one person and another who belong to different um, power levels. So let's say in the Indian society, those differences would be big. In a capitalist society, those differences would be significant. In an egalitarian society, those differences would be minimal. Um, and it depends on the culture itself, you know, how it's structured. Uh, for example, the caste system or um, the, the class system, uh, race in South Africa, for example, those dis distances could be quite significant. Um, so if that is brought into a small group, the dynamic will change accordingly. If those cultural differences are brought in by individuals who carry them, their perceptions of power differences would be inherently present in their group work. Uh, for example, you know, let's say I'm working with a Chinese colleague and in his culture, you never refer to another person, especially if that person is older than you or um, stands at a higher level in the um, organizational hierarchy, you never call them by their first names. And it was quite a struggle. Me, um, and my uh, colleague, John Arakaki, calling our then department chair, Art Doria, you know, calling Dr. Doria and Doria being an American, um, refusing to accept that because he said, it would look like I'm making you call me Dr. Doria. Whereas for us, it was impossible to think of someone who's your father's age and your superior to be called by their first name. 
it took me a long time to start calling my advisor, who was older than my father, uh, my advisor by his first name. But he insisted because in an American culture, it is offensive if you're uh, distinguishing those, uh, the age and um, position that sharply. So the second aspect of culture, uncertainty avoidance, is how much um, stress you associate with uncertainty. In the Armenian society, you can have, let's meet tomorrow about this time, about this place, and it's fine, because you know that nothing is certain. Tomorrow is not a given. If we survive, if we're alive tomorrow, then we'll, we'll meet. When you have a child, you don't buy clothes for the child until the child is born, because you never know. So I would assume that uncertainty uh, comes with cultures that are more vulnerable, accepting uncertainty as a given, accepting your powerlessness against uncertainty is a given, whereas in a highly developed, highly organized society, such as some European countries or, or the United States, planning is a way of reducing stress. Pre-planning, predicting, preparing is a way of reducing stress. For an Armenian person, we're organized differently. It is creating stress because I know it's a bad, it's bad omen to, <laughs> to plan. Like we had everything planned for the second half of our spring semester and look what happened. You can never be prepared. So uh, let me pause here before we move on to the next portion of the next aspects of cultural um, differences and continue in, in another segment of our lecture because our time is running out. Um, we'll talk in a second. <music> 